This week on A Lively Experiment, a federal judge hearing an appeal to the state shoreline access bill tells opponents the ball is not in his court. And is there a better way than special elections to fill vacant seats or vote on bond referendums? A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS. Joining us with the analysis, Ken Block, founder of the nonprofit group Watchdog RI, Brown University political science professor Wendy Schiller, and Harrison Tuttle, president of the Black Lives Matter Rhode Island Political Action Committee. Welcome to this week's Lively. I'm Jim Hummel. It is great to have you with us. Challengers to a recently passed shoreline access bill suffered a setback when U.S. District Court Judge William Smith tossed their case on Tuesday, saying that federal court was not the right jurisdiction for an appeal. The unanswered question, will property owners upset with the bill refile the suit in state court? So, Wendy, that remains to be seen, but this is a victory for those who've been trying to open up the shore. We, it was funny that you and Ken were on here the last time we had this discussion just as this bill was being filed. So this is the next step in the process. Look, I can understand people who bought a property expected a particular kind of like lifestyle condition where they would have privacy. Um, but you have to understand and know that nobody owns the ocean, nobody owns the sand and the beach. And we have, you know, because of climate change and beach erosion, we have shifting lines. And people work hard and they want to enjoy the shoreline on the weekends or during the day. And if people are not making too much noise or invading your space, then this is something you have to live with as being part of society and you live in the ocean state. So that's just, that's where I am on this. I mean, I get it, but you know, you can't just close off public entities to people who, who live in the state and have every right to use them. This is a big issue for you. Access. It's a huge issue for me. I've advocated for access the whole way. And even though what the court fight is now, it's about lateral access, the ability to walk along the beach. There's another problem, a huge problem that has to be dealt with in this state. And that's perpendicular access. How do you actually get onto the beach? And my community, our community is infamous for making it very difficult to get access to public rights away so you can make use of them. That's the next fight. And I'm glad that this case was thrown out of court. And I look forward to helping bring the next piece of this to fruition and helping to open up access. Well, and particularly shore. in Barrington, it's there, the, you know, CRMC has these beautiful little stone things and, oh, this is a right of way. You can't park within 400 miles of the, so you yeah. got to, you know, hike it in or take the backpack or the, it does, they don't make it easy, right? They make it impossible for way too many people to do. Right. Harrison? Yeah, I mean, I think the General Assembly, you know, consulted with many advocates, legal advocates, and, you know, I think with them passing this legislation, they fully understood that this could go all the way up to the Supreme Court, possibly. Um, and so I think it's just really important that people understand this new law. I mean, it's important to know that a lot of people are not tapped into legislation that's getting passed throughout the, the year. And so being able to have that knowledge um, just so people understand is going to be really important. And, and it seems like the attorney general's geared for a fight. He's like, yeah. hey, bring it on, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this is going to come down to, uh, this is obviously a Rhode Island constitution issue. And so I would imagine that it stays a Rhode Island issue. Yeah, and that's what the federal judge said. Okay, to be continued, we just wanted to give you that update because we did talk about it last week. We are in the middle of a special election season. We had one last year in CD2. Of course, we'll be talking about CD1 momentarily. But, Ken, you and I were talking offline about should we be holding special elections with such a small number of people, not only for unexpired terms, but maybe bond issues where people are deciding millions and millions of dollars? Well, I think for bond issues, there should be a statewide prohibition on asking for votes in a special election to allocate that kind of money. Unless it's a dire emergency, there's no way a normal bonding should happen in a special election because we know empirically that special elections are not well attended. The turnout is dramatically lower in special elections than it is in, in regularly scheduled elections. And when it comes to filling a seat like for Congress, like we just had right now, you know, the, the, win the winner is going has coming out of the Democratic primary with 10, 15,000 votes, 20,000 votes, right? It's a very small piece of the total electorate. I don't think it's a great way to choose leaders, and maybe we should be appointing people to temporarily fill a seat 
and hold off on a proper election with a regularly scheduled election because I don't know what it, what's not meaningful to me that somebody wins a poorly attended election. There's no mandate attached to that. There's, there's really not much compelling about it. It's very expensive to conduct an election and not enough people to participate. I would argue that it's probably not a good idea to have special elections. Um, well, I, I disagree, uh, not on the bond issue, because I think that takes a lot of education and knowledge, and we really want... And those are for long-term projects, For long-term projects. Right. But here's, here's my dilemma with this, with this proposition, is that in this special election for CD1, which we'll talk about, there was a lot of diversity in the candidates, and the person who emerged from the de Democratic primary is a diverse candidate. And, you know, perhaps if Governor McKee had the appointment power, he would have appointed somebody diverse, but let's just take the scenario, does he choose to be an Amatos? let's say, or Sandra Cano, right? one of those two people. But that cuts out a lot of other people that could be in there. So if you're not embedded in the elite political network of your state, you're unlikely to be a candidate to be appointed. And that's what makes me uncomfortable. If we were at better parity across the country or in Rhode Island, then I would be on your side of this. But without that yet, I'm, I would rather have a special election and have it open. Yeah, I think low voter turnout in CD1 also can be directly tied to the fact that our voters need to be more engaged. We need more civic education. We need more organizations that are focused specifically on this issue. And the minute that we take away our democratic process is the minute that we take the process out of the hands of the voters, no matter how many voters vote. And I think the process should be looking to increase the number of voting. I know Secretary of State Amore is working on working with high school youth to establish you know, youth clubs there to be able to get that. That's really important, being able to have somebody understand the process, who's running, and also how to vote, um, I think, is, is more important to the question than whether or not we should throw away a special election, which are very rare, even though we've had a, a quite a bit yeah. over the last couple of years. So I remember when John Chafee died, we go we rewind 2025 20, years when John Chafee died. Link Chafee was going to run already, and he had announced his retirement. But Link, the way that it was set up for the Senate it, by Rhode Island rules, uh, Link Amon, the Republican governor, was able to appoint somebody. So he appointed Link Chafee, who got kind of the head start. There was a lot of hand wringing among the Democrats here who said, "We need to change this because cause clearly he wasn't going to appoint a Democrat, and that would change now." Is that govern? It's governed by the states then, then federally, right? You decide in Rhode Island how you're yes. going to fill that seat. Yes. So every so to Ken's point, across the country, every state has a different rule, and they have sometimes different rules for Senate versus House. And in fact, also some states have a rule that you have to appoint somebody from the party of the person who vacated the seat. So like Utah, Wyoming says, you know, if you're going to appoint a, somebody who's going to sit there for a year and a half or something until the next election, if, if a Republican retires, you have to appoint a Republican, even if you're a Democrat. Because you're taking away the voter's intention. By, right, exactly. Right. So it's, it's a very complicated thing that we have a patchwork across the country because of this one, you know, clause of the Constitution that says states shall regulate time, place, and manner of elections. How would, how would it look for you? Doing it? Well, have you gone through scenarios? No, in your mind? I, I have. I haven't. I haven't gone through. Come on, uh, detail, man. You usually have a whole I've, spreadsheet. I read the Providence up. teachers' contract in advance for this thing. So that's what I, <laughs> All right, well, that's don't peek too early. But you can, I mean, you can imagine a scenario where um, you know we spend money on these elections too. So you know that's another issue. But you know the person who comes out, Gabe Amo comes out as a nominee, or Gary Leonard. You know they got to run again, and there's potentially another primary. So it, you can argue that it's a waste of. Of, yeah. of taxpayer dollars. However, if Gabe Amo is somebody that the Democratic Party you know, wants to see in Congress, then this person has managed to come through the system, uh, even though they weren't the favorite or the most prominent, and they may turn out to be a fantastic representative if they win, or Gary Leonard, the same side. So I, I think in the end, turning out more voters should always be our goal. You know, say, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, let's also realize the amount of candidates that ran. Some people say that that's a bad thing. Some people say that that's encouraging. Um, the fact that there was a special election and we saw so many candidates from so many different backgrounds, an immigrant who won from the city of Pawtucket and Gabe Amo, the, pri the primary, being able to have so many people say, I can put my hat in, I think is encouraging when it comes to the electoral process. It's, so, say, go ahead. But that's because the power of incumbency was removed for this election. Right. right? So yeah. if we really want competitive elections, we should be making changes to remove the power of incumbency so that we can get fresh faces and more people into the process in our regular, uh, regularly scheduled elections. That, to me, that's one of the bigger reforms that we could make to open up 
who can serve and who can actually compete, who can be competitive if we start making changes to remove the power of incumbents. Yeah, and yeah. to that point, we suffered as a state because Representative Cicilline stepped down and we still don't have a vote from the CD1 in the Congress. Right, so there's a missing voice for Rhode Island. Yeah, I mean, that's within months of the election, and some months state, of getting Some sworn states in. actually will appoint someone immediately to fill the seat until the special election, and I think that's a better system mm. that we could adopt than what we so have now. So, just briefly, Senator Zurier, Sam Zurier, in uh, 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 up at the state house, has a commission looking at how we vote, and it's looking at a variety of things. But Wendy, we've talked about this before. The whole this election we talked about should early voting be this long? I think it. You know, some people say we could um, shorten it up a little bit, but Rank choice voting, and that sometimes it sounds great in theory, but then it gets very confusing for people. Uh, I always thought that it would get confusing for people, but I think I'm wrong because people in Maine figured out how to do it. People in New York City figure out how to do it. It took it, uh, it took them like a week to figure out that Eric Adams had won. That, that doesn't that, inspire confidence. No, but but it does give third or alternative parties a much better chance of getting a foothold in American politics because you you rank and say I like this person best then another person, then another person. So the viability of that third person, which we don't usually think about, becomes much more possible. So I think if you want more voice and more parties and you want to break the two-party stranglehold, ranked choice voting will take yeah. us in that direction. So in Maine, thousands of votes were, voters were disenfranchised because they did not vote the ranked choice vote correctly and they, <laughs> their votes couldn't be counted at all. So now, if a thousand voters were disenfranchised by Republicans, there would be a hue and an outcry, but in Maine, a thousand voters lost their vote. They were completely disenfranchised by the voting mechanism. I don't think that's good. I think that's terrible. Uh, uh, MIT election researchers uh, did blind studies asking voters to tell them how they perceived the ranked choice ballot, and there was a lot of confusion about it. It's documented in studies. I, <coughs> excuse me, I should like ranked choice voting. As somebody who likes third parties, I don't like it. <clears throat> Harrison, go ahead. No, no, Harrison, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, ranked choice voting has picked up legislation mm -hmm. in our General Assembly here, I believe, by Rebecca, Re Representative Rebecca Kislak. And so, you know, I think when it comes to being able to have and get out of that incumbency power that is, is so dominated here in Rhode Island and all throughout the country, um, I, I had a sense that talking to people and on the doors and, and throughout different circles that people would be in favor of ranked choice voting. And you ran for, you ran for a state <coughs> house seat. Uh, house state seat. Senate. Yep. Uh, state Senate in 22. 22, yep. Yeah, it seems like a very long time ago, doesn't it? It's well, just a year ago. Just a historical note, because Rhode Island's so great about history, is that as a nation, we slowly, in the 1880s all the way through just about 1910, we moved from having a party ballot, which was color-coded in Rhode Island, right? So you took a blue ballot if you were this party, or, or and then you didn't have any choices. You just took the ballot put your name or an X on it, and, and then put it in and voted to what's called office block, trying to figure out which party, which candidate for which office. And the whole country eventually switched to that. And the level of education level, you know, was much lower than it was, it is today. So, you know, we managed to figure out how to do it in the 1880s, all the way through the 1900s. People learn, people will get used to it. But I agree that it can be confusing. Mm. But I think if you're looking to change the system, and particularly party dominance, um, I think you have to weigh the, the difficulties of disenfranchising now for people who voted versus where we could be 20 years from now breaking the stranglehold of the two major parties. Yeah. Look, I'm all about breaking the stranglehold of the two parties. <laughs> I just, I'm How's just that not, going? I, yeah, <laughs> I, I just don't know that the, the ranked choice ballot is, uh, is the mechanism to do it. Yeah, we'll see what Senator yeah. Zuri's commission has to do. Let's, uh, let's go to CD1. This is the first time we've had you guys on since the primary. And first of all, Harrison, welcome. This is your first time to Lively, Thank so uh, welcome and good to have you. And somebody who has been in the arena, as has Ken over the years. Um, give me your thoughts about, first, the victory and where we go from here for Gabe Amo. Were you surprised by the margin? I was. I was incredibly surprised. I was talking to, to Gabe uh, just two days ago, and he had mentioned that he had hired three field campaign directors, something that no other campaign had done. And what uh, does that do for him? And what that does is that puts boots on the ground. I mean, we knew that this special election was going to come down to being able to door knock and specifically target voters that were informed. Unfortunately, we talked about how many voters weren't informed, and we need to do that. But when running a campaign, specifically this race, it was really important that every candidate had as many volunteers on the ground as possible. And for someone who had, some, had an experience in government, 
But many voters didn't know. And for someone to be an immigrant and a black man uh, from the city of Pawtucket, you know, I think this is a huge watershed moment for Rhode Island, being able to have representation in the most uh, diverse district um, here in Rhode Island. Did you think that Aaron Regenberg was going to win going into primary? I didn't know who was going to win. I thought that, you know, so much of this race was going to be decided by a couple of areas, particularly the east side, and was really uh, interested to see how that broke down. You had Councilman John Gonzalez, you had others like Aaron Regenberg, who was running, who had prominent areas of interest in that. But when we looked at the outcomes of how each city and town voted, Gabe Amo dominated all of them. And I think that's reflective of the voting uh, outlook. It, that was over. Yeah, Regenberg didn't make up enough where he needed to to counteract where Amo did well. Correct. Yeah, and also he won on every level. He won same day, he won early voting, and he won mail-in. No so uh, Amo, uh, same day registration. I think same-day registration would go a long way to solving a lot of these issues. And people also don't know that you can vote in a primary, you can affiliate, if you're an independent, you can go in, walk in, affiliate with the party, take the ballot, vote, and then disaffiliate on your way out. But I think same-day registration in this day and age, there's no excuse not to have it, and I think it would help. Were you surprised by the margin? When? I was I was surprised, yes. I mean, I was surprised that he won, although he did something very, I think, strategically smart in terms of uh, gaming it when he said, basically, look, I'm not in first place now. I'm, re I'm releasing this poll, but I'm actually within striking distance, and Sabina Matos has fallen, and if you don't love Aaron Regenberg, you could vote for me, and given the vote margins, I could win. That was a really smart thing to do as a campaign. Yeah. I didn't vote in the primary. I talked to a lot of people who did vote in the primary, and... You know, there were a lot of very strong polarized feelings amongst the participants in the in the Democratic primary. Uh, it seems to me like uh, an appropriate person w came out of that, uh, the winner. Uh, you know, for me, it's it's effectively a statewide race, and it was conducted literally, you know, by knocking on doors. It's kind of it's kind of a weird Rhode Islandism, right? Yeah. In most other places, a congressional you, 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 seat yeah, you don't, for you don't maybe see. a million dollars, yeah. and you win with what? What did he have? Twelve thousand, yeah. fourteen thousand yeah. votes, yeah. right? It's it's really kind of unique. I don't think we should have voter registration at all. I believe that as a citizen, your birthright is to vote, and this concept of needing to register. Yeah. To, to vote is very weird will thing. never let that yeah. What do you think about that one? No, because incumbents like to know who's going to vote so they can target them and go and door to door. Right. And that's why they don't even want same day registration because it creates more uncertainty on game day and they don't like it. But well, we should we should call for it. Yeah, I mean and, and let's also it's important to recognize that when you're running a campaign, you're you're specifically at a local level, whether it's state senate or even city council, a lot of campaigns only knock the doors in which they know people will vote frequently. And so you may have a case in which somebody's registered to vote, but they've never voted before, period. So don't waste your time. Well, that's the mindset of Or consolidate of a your resources if you right. can only knock on X number of doors. Although it Obama and Trump each ignored that yep. and won, right? Yep. But using social media and texting and said, we're taking a whole block of people, you're going to go to everybody's house, whether we know they voted for, for us before or not, um, and uh, get them registered and get them into the campaign. Both of them did that. And I think that's the key, is, is that same-day registration, it allows people to be more involved in our democratic process. I mean, we should want everybody who has the ability to vote, who's a U.S. citizen, to vote. And I think the, the closer that we get to that um, is for the better for our state. Same day, same day, no voting at all. No voting <laughs> no registration. registration. I mean, that's what I mean, no voting registration. No voting at all. And there that's wasn't a voter registration until sort of the career politician evolved in the late 18th, late 19th, early 20th century, when you started to have people who ran again and again and again, which didn't really happen that often, they cared a lot about who was going to vote, and they started to implement voter registration. So yeah. it's an incumbency advantage tool. All right. We could do an entire half hour on this, but again, Ken and I were talking off, uh, off air before we came in about education in Rhode Island. So let's block off the next three hours to talk about that. <laughs> uh, in the five or six minutes that we have, um, the, in myriad things, Steph, Steph Machado had a mind-blowing piece yesterday, but maybe not so mind-blowing, about absentee rates in Providence and that half of the uh, student population was considered absentee, which is, I think, 18 days or more, and a lot of them were 30 days or more. So, Ken, why don't you dive into this? Yeah. So I literally read the contract in, in preparation for coming in here today because I firmly believe that the job of teaching is a white-collar job. This is job. the Providence Teachers' this, Contract. This is the tro Providence Teachers' Contract. Uh, but yet that contract is 65 pages long, and it gets into 
excruciating detail about what a teacher should or shouldn't do and what they get paid to do this or that or the other thing. Uh, in most white collar jobs, their contract is one or two pages. It defines your job is to do this particular job well and we're going to pay you X and you know, we would leave it to management to figure out all the other pieces. When you read the Providence teacher's contract, one of the first things it says is all of the contents of the previous contract are incorporated into this new contract by reference. When you read the old, of the, that previous contract, that goes backwards and it goes backwards and it goes backwards. So if you want to know what's in the current Providence teacher's contract, you cannot read one document to figure that out. You have to go back decades and read all of the contracts. To you can't manage to that. What about right. the larger issue about the takeover and where Providence is? And, you know, Mayor Smiley is taking, hinting that we want to get it back, but maybe not right away. Yeah, I think, you know, so much of this, this takeover is going to have to come down to the school board and the, the upcoming election that's going on. I mean, these are going to be appointed slash elected positions um, that's going to be split, I believe, halfway. And so uh, these school positions... That's are, a change, right? That's, that's yeah. a change. And these positions are going to represent multiple wards. I mean, so think about how powerful these seats are and how influential their, their decisions are going to be made moving forward. On the absentee issues, I, I think the, the, where we need to look at the root causes of why kids are absent. And we know that there are issues around poverty here in Rhode Island, and we need to have more wraparound services around after-school programs and health care um, and, and being able to make sure that kids are able to eat at school. I mean, all of these things are critically important when it comes to whether or not a kid goes to school or not. More, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think Harrison's point is 100% uh, on, on target. And I also want to know for data purposes, I understand we're looking at the year before, the year before that. Let's just really think about COVID. Let's think about sort of the practices of when somebody gets sick or has a sniffle or has a cold. Maybe they didn't have access to a test because the government stopped giving them out for free. So you don't know what to do with your child if they're sick. Do you send them? Do you infect people? So the rate of absentee is, is I think, a larger issue. But I think some of it must be due to some COVID hangover practices. So we need to do this year and next year and really see what these trends are like. But a safe housing environment, a safe way to get to school and being, not, being fed are, are fundamental to academic success. And we have to do a better job of it. Yeah. So I have a friend, close friend, who decided she wanted to teach in the Providence schools. And she applied for and uh, obtained a position last year. And uh, she taught in middle school. Uh, it took a month of her working before they paid her. Her math textbooks didn't arrive for about 10 weeks after she started teaching. And she had violent children in the classroom. Why'd she want to teach in Providence? Because she wanted to make a difference and she lasted about two and a half months and she left. Wow. So the problems in Providence are multi-layered. It's an administration problem. It's a problem with a few problematic students. There, there are. It's so complex and it's so broken and we desperately need to fix it because what we are doing in Providence and in other urban core schools is fundamentally unfair to the children that we're harming. Or failing for, generations. For, right? I mean, it, it is creating and sustaining generational deficiencies and problems in the ability of human beings to excel in their lives. We have to fix it. We have to stop messing around with it. Whether the control is at Providence, who failed to well run these schools for decades, or whether it's being run by the state now, mm -hmm. nobody has done it right. Nobody deserves to run at this, po at this point. We need a different answer for how to make this work. Final thought on that? Well, the argument about public choice and using public taxpayer dollars for vouchers in public schools um, and thinking about in, in, in encouraging more competition across schools through that system. Other cities have done this with public dollars and, you know, especially parents from low income communities have said that this empowers them and, and that they can make sure that their child gets to a school that they're going to thrive in. So that's coming down the pike, whether it comes, you know, in the next couple of years, I'm not sure, but it's coming. Okay, let's do um, outrages and or kudos. Mr. Block, let's begin with you this week. I have a kudo. This may be oh the first time goodness, I've done a kudo in who knows how long. The Providence Journal is running a terrific story this Sunday about the Block Island fire. Mm. And Katie Mulvaney and Antonia Nuri Farzan wrote an astonishingly great piece about the fire, about the response to the fire. It was first-class journalism. It blew me away when I read it, and I just need to call out the journal and to those 
uh, reporters. What a great job they did. I hope they win all kinds of awards because of that reporting. And I hope we see a lot more reporting like that. Mm. It really is justification for having a state paper, and it should cause people to want to uh, pay for it and to read it. Harrison, again, welcome. Your first time on Lively. Should we, I pull the, should we keep him? What do you think? Yeah. Oh, bring him, bring him back next time. Um, do you have well, an our game? Yeah, there you go. The judges are uh, the judges are pretty tough. Um, an outrage or a kudo this week? Well, I've survived the hazing period. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Oh, we have worms in the uh, the green room when you get out. So, uh, but I have an outrage. Uh, what's going on uh, and what the city of Pawtucket is going through right now, particularly when it comes to Officer Dolan's situation around Leobor, um, is, is particularly concerning when we look at the actions by the officer, not only uh, dating back going all the way to 2021, but also looking at um, his recent arrest. I think it's a huge point of concern, and I hope the General Assembly does something finally after three years of debating around what to do around Leobor. Right. Yeah, this man's still being paid by tax pay, tax yeah, a lot dollars. Of money. A lot of money, and it's outrageous. No what do you have, money. Professor? Um, I am sick of um, you know eight people in the House of Representatives or a couple of people in the Senate shutting things down all the time. You're elected to be a Congressperson. You're going to. This is a system, and if you don't like it and you don't care about it, and you want to destroy it, you know, get out of politics. Don't go and tell your constituents you're doing the best thing for them by shutting the government down and by costing us hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, and disrupting the core functions of government. You swear an oath to the Constitution to uphold the Constitution. And this is the government the Constitution produces. And you have, a, you have an obligation not to shut it down because you're cranky or you want to make a political point. And this is just Sounds outrageous. like you're cranky about it. Yeah. It costs us money. Listen, everybody pays taxes. Every day the government shuts down and inefficiency alone costs us so much money. Get angry about it. Don't, don't swallow the rhetoric that they're doing it on behalf of you. They're doing it to make a point. They don't care about what the impact is on you. And they have an obligation not to shut it down. So let me ask you as a corollary to that, Tommy Tuberville has been a one-man stop sign. So how does that work procedurally? Why is he? Why is one man able to hold up all these military so promotions? So Tommy Tuberville is a senator from Alabama. They have a lot of defense contracting in Alabama, although uh, Biden just moved a, a big source of federal jobs from Huntsville out of Huntsville, which cannot make Tuberville happy. But uh, these are nominations, and executive nominations, can, you have to close them out with 51 votes, but you have to hold 30 hours of debate on each nomination. Nomination. There were 300 nominations. So th that leaves the person who runs the Senate, the Democrats, Chuck Schumer, that would clog the entire Senate for the entire for six months. That's all they'd be doing. That's all they'd be doing. But this is about abortion policy that that the, the, the Defense Department will will allow somebody who's in the military to go to a state that allows abortion under a reasonable time frame that uh, from a state that doesn't. And that is something Tuberville wants them to reverse, and they will not reverse it. He let three nominations get voted on this week. That's it. And that is what's wrong with the United States Senate. All right. In, in 30 minutes or less. Uh, folks, that is all the time we have. Ken, good to see you and Wendy and Harrison. Welcome. Uh, come back here next week. We will have a full analysis of all the week. You never know what's going to happen over the course of the week, but what you do know is we will be talking about it on next week's Alive League Experiment. Join us then. Have a great weekend. A Lively Experiment is generously underwritten by... Hi, I'm John Hazen White, Jr. For over 30 years, A Lively Experiment has provided insight and analysis of the political issues that face Rhode Islanders. I'm a proud supporter of this great program and Rhode Island PBS.